everybody. You're at home with Melissa and I'm getting ready to go to a local lake to try out a new skill that I'm trying to develop. So uh, as we wait for the windscreen to clear off because there was a hard frost last night, um, we're toward the end of winter and normally at this time of year we'd be covered in Quite a bit of ice and snow. This year we're not, but we are still getting some temperatures overnight that allow for a lot of frost on your window in the morning. And so we need to wait for that to clear off before we can drive away because we need to be able to see. So I figure this is the perfect opportunity for me to tell you about, uh, to talk to you about rabies. There, turn that down so it's not as loud. I don't know if you could hear it too well or not. It was the uh, defogger. My car is very noisy. Um, all right, so I want to talk to you about rabies, and this might be important to you, as particularly if you live somewhere I do, like where I do, where you actually could encounter rabies. <laughs> you know, if if you're from Britain, I don't think you guys have rabies, do you? If if any of you out there are our British friends and, and you'd like to let us know, uh, please drop something in the comment section for us to see because I'm not sure, but I think you guys don't have rabies. Is that right? Anyway, uh, before we get to talking about it, I want to tell you a story and it is relevant. It really is. It's the reason I thought of doing this video. And it started off with last week I talked to my doctor I had a regular checkup appointment and we were talking and uh, we both feel that I should be among those people who get a pre-exposure vaccine uh, generally speaking veterinarians and things get these uh, it's it's not something most people get and but my doctor and I talked about it and and with the kinds of things I do in the kind of places that I am uh, we both figure it's a good idea for me to get a pre-exposure vaccine and so <laughs> we talked about this just last week and then two days ago I decided to get up early and well not early for me but I decided to leave early being you know kind of before the rest of the world was getting up and around and just I hadn't had any coffee or anything and I go and I took this little drive and then I was on my way home and on the main street in town here close to my home I saw a groundhog and he looked like he wanted to head for the road now those of you who aren't familiar with groundhogs uh, probably need a little explanation groundhogs are tiny little mammals juveniles about yay long about this long for an adult and they kind of remind me in terms of the way they're built and the way they behave they kind of remind me like larger versions of, of larger versions of the guinea pig okay they they're herbivores and their normal natural behavior in the wild if they're not used to being around humans and things because some I mean they quite often are found in towns and cities and things like that and you know they, they graze pretty much anywhere they're they get along well with anyone. They hibernate through the winter. And uh, I grew up in Punxsutawney, called the home of the groundhog. And uh, I don't know if you've heard of that or not. Groundhog Day, uh, weather prognosticating Punxsutawney Phil. Uh, basically the lure that uh, developed the first official trek. I need to stop this and explain a little bit better. It was 18... I don't remember the date. 1803, 18, 18, 1887, something like that. I don't know. In the 1800s, a group of people made the first official trek to what we call Gobbler's Knob. Gobbler refers to wild turkey. And they went there to find groundhogs and to find a groundhog because of an old Scottish couplet that is, if Candlemas Day is bright and clear, there will be two winters in the year. So basically they went to look for a groundhog because they thought that, you know, if the groundhog threw a shadow, which became saying if the groundhog sees a shadow, uh, then winter will last 
much longer. Whereas if it's overcast and the groundhog throws no shadow, therefore the groundhog doesn't see a shadow, uh, spring will come earlier. And in an area where there's a lot of ice and snow, yeah, it's kind of something that people look forward to because uh, people tend to semi-hibernate through the winter. They stay indoors and things like that. And they're, come spring, they're pretty excited about getting back out. So they would look for this. And it became kind of a local legend. And now it's pretty much known worldwide. And our tiny little town um, sees tens of thousands of tourists for Groundhog Day, which is February 2nd. And so, you know, the groundhogs will live around people and hibernate in the winter. And this poor thing, he's trying to sleep and they wake him up, drag him outdoors, drag him to the same old place, Gobbler's Knob. And they have a stage there and, and you know, they have this big ceremony and things that they do now. And, and um, <laughs> the groundhog's probably just going, what? And this groundhog, Punxsutawney Phil, he actually has a habitat that they set up in our local library and he lives there so he's the official one but you know his relatives the unofficial groundhogs they can live just about anywhere they're out and about uh, when the weather's right and they just kind of graze well if they're used to people being near them maybe they don't run away when they see a human being but that's because they're just used to being in that odd situation of living near people. Most groundhogs, their natural response to human beings is to run. And they can actually run really fast, which is surprising because they have stumpy little legs. But um, if they see a human being, they usually don't let you get anywhere near them before they run off. And I saw the other day, day before yesterday, this groundhog who was at the edge of the main road through town and looked like he wanted to cross. And you know, I didn't know. Maybe he'll go out. We use salt in the winter. Our borough does. Our township. Uh, they use salt to clear ice from the roads. And one of the bad things about that is that salt often attracts animals who then will go out on the roads to eat the salt, to lick the salt off the road. And so I didn't want this groundhog to go out and get killed. And I decided, okay, I'm going to just stop my car because there was an alley near where he was. I thought, I'll just stop my car and I'll startle him and get him to go the opposite direction and go away from the road. Simple. Normally this is not a problem because the normal behavior of a groundhog is to run when they see you. And there was a signpost right beside the groundhog and when I walked toward him, he went around the signpost and came back toward the road and me. And I should have known better. I, I really, I mean, seriously, I come from, I know the woods, I know animals, my family know the woods, we know animals. Um, I've, from the time I was a small child, I, when I participated as part of a four person team in a statewide competition about ecology, which all focused on animal behavior and sign, we took third place, all right? So I'm not just someone who's heard of things and I should know, but I, I'm blaming it on I hadn't had my coffee yet, all right? Because when you hear this story, if you know where it's going, you're just going to be going, really? You're an idiot. <laughs> so, but what happened is I stopped to startle this guy and he went out around the signpost. And I just thought that me being there had freaked him out and that he had wanted to cross the street and was still thinking about going on the street and the fact that I had startled him is why he did this next thing which was really strange going around the sign and coming back toward me all right now if you know where this is going this is probably like the moment when you're watching one of those um horror flicks where someone says well I'm gonna go outside and see what that sound was and you're sitting in the audience saying no don't do it well yeah this is the no don't do it moment because when he went around that sign and back toward me I should have clued in but didn't and instead I just kind of hunched over like this to startle him to startle him away from the road oh that did not happen he chased me he tore after me to attack me and that is not behavior that a groundhog normally does. And so I turn to run. As I'm doing so, I'm thinking, great, great. 
I just talked to my doctor about a rabies shot. Haven't had my serums yet. Haven't had the shots. And I'm going to get bitten today by a rabid animal. Because that behavior is so odd. And any behavior that's really odd for a mammal in an area where there's rabies means that that particular individual is a pretty good contender in the suspect list for rabid animals. You know, so as I turn to run, I think, great, great. How's that for irony? Just talk about the shot. Don't get it yet. I'm going to be bitten today. But when I fell, falling onto, which was pretty much two steps on because you know those of you who watch my channel on a regular basis you know I'm crippled <laughs> I don't my my body doesn't my my lower body doesn't function properly so I turn and try to run and fall flat on my face out onto the main road thank goodness people were just starting to get up and around and I was lucky enough that no one was coming at that moment because they would have had no time to respond and react and not run me over. I fell on the road coming the other direction was a man in a pickup truck. He got out of the truck and he came toward me and he said, are you okay? I saw that groundhog chase you. Not something I've ever heard anyone say before in English. Oh, are you all right? I've never heard that ground. I, I saw that groundhog chase you. Groundhog chase you, just that doesn't sound right. But anyway, it did happen and the guy came to see if I was okay. And I said, yeah, I'm all right. And explained to him what was happening. And he got into the back of his pickup and pulled out a four inch diameter piece of PVC pipe and went and started kind of ushering the groundhog away. Now, I think that had I not been there, he would have probably dispatched the animal. I think, you know, he was fully aware that this animal had to be rabid. And, you know, by this point, um, I had told myself, okay, he ran after me top speed, so he wasn't exhibiting signs of neurological problems with the falling over and staggering like a drunk, which animals will do later as the disease progresses. Um, so I was telling myself, no, it was something else. It wasn't rabies, but that uh, is where I'm blaming the caffeine that wasn't coursing through my veins and usually is, but before I do anything, um, because I should have realized that the strange behavior in itself and the fact that the groundhog was going in circles, he walked around the sign and then instead of attacking me, he went around the sign again. Walking in circles can be a sign of rabies. And I should have realized and didn't. And I think that the only reason that this guy, I think he was fully aware that this animal was rabid and would have dispatched it had I not been there. And he didn't because he thought that as a girl, I might, you know, cry. And so right behind him, another fellow had pulled in in a white pickup truck. And, you know, he joined in our activity and basically what we were doing now is the three of us talking about rabies talking about because by now I've woke up a little bit and I realize you know this animal does have rabies and we're talking about it and the two gentlemen are trying to usher the animal away from you know trying to get it to go away from this populated area because just a block behind where we are at that moment where we were at that moment uh, there are woods and you know, they were trying to get him to go that direction, I think, as opposed to being right where there are a lot of human beings and a lot of their pets running around to be attacked and infected. And um, so we're creating a bunch of chaos between the three of us running around doing our thing and this groundhog, which is now running laps around the back tire of a parked car. Um, and so traffic on the main road is starting to pick up now. Like I said, it. They, I had gone out before people were getting up and around. Now they're all on their way to work and traffic is pretty heavy on that road and people are stopping because of the commotion we have going on to see what's happening at such an early time of the day. And so traffic is now backed up going both directions out in front of us. We're chasing this groundhog. And uh, finally, the, the fella from the black pickup truck said, uh, I, I was on my way to work. I have to get to work. I'm glad everything's all right and uh as we were all walking back to their cars I told the guys I said uh yeah I was supposed to get vaccinated against rabies I haven't had my shot yet and we all started laughing so I went home and I told my mother what had happened and you know she realized that 
first of all, the, the heel of my hand, you can't really see it, I don't think. Well, maybe you can a little bit. This was all bruised, but not badly. It's already healing a little bit, but you can still see it. It's bruised. My knee, my left knee is what looks really bad. It's scraped up and stuff from falling on the asphalt. And, you know, I'm telling her the story of what had just happened. Basically, at that moment in time, I'm finding the whole thing really funny. Because, you know, no harm, no foul. Might as well laugh. And... And my mother, realizing how dangerous this could have been, and the fact that I had injured myself, uh, she was trying hard not to laugh, and eventually said so. And I said, go ahead and laugh. And we both laughed and laughed. And then we called my cousin Brandy, and if you are one of our regular friends, and I haven't told a lot of stories involving my cousin Brandy. I'm sure at some point I will, because she's hilarious. And we called her, and she laughed at me. And then we called my niece Bailey. She's like 13 or 14 years old and they live in the woods and and so she knows what's going on. She laughed at me. She really laughed. We all thought it was funny except my dad who called me an idiot and said, you know, why were you going to interact with a wild animal? Basically saying moron. And I said, well, it's a groundhog. I just wanted to startle him away from the road. I mean, normally this is not in any way, shape, or form a dangerous thing to do. It's not. It was just, he was infected. Now, here's the thing. This is why uh, rabies is such a big concern. In all of history, they say rabies has a 100% uh, kill rate, 100% lethal this virus and the reason is is that in all of human history now I had read and heard and seen and things about one case where a woman had survived uh, infection of rabies without having been vaccinated and she only survived because of a lot of intervention for modern medicine she was put into a medically induced coma and things like that to give time for antivirals to work and things uh, since then, I, I heard it said on a documentary I was watching on infectious disease, someone stated that there have only ever been four cases where an untreated human survived the infection, and you know, an unvaccinated human. So basically, in all of history, even if it is the higher number, four people have survived, you're looking at a disease that for all intents and purposes, you can say it's 100% lethal. And it has, no animal has ever, other than a human, has ever survived it. And so, yeah, that's, there's no cure. You know, it, it's a very serious thing. And it attacks your brain and central nervous system. So, I'm trying to decide what direction, if, to, to go with this, how to start talking about the disease itself. Now that I told you my embarrassing story, I should have realized. But, um, because, oh, and not only that, I'm not just from an area with rabies where we've all heard of it and know the signs of this and that. I've also dealt with, had, had moments with rabid animals in the past. I had to dispatch a rabid raccoon once. I had to actually and I'm not going to tell the details of this story, but had to defend someone and protect them from a rabid raccoon on another occasion. And I have seen, along with friends and family, a lot of rabid skunks and things from a distance. So it's not, I should have known. I should have. So basically, it affects the central nervous system. And um, you can only get rabies. You can only become infected from an animal's saliva, brain, or nervous system tissue, okay? Um, my understanding is even blood, no. I wouldn't want a rabbit animal's blood on me, frankly. But you can definitely get it from saliva, brain tissue, or nervous system tissue. Therefore, if you're bitten by an animal that you either know or suspect has rabies, you must get treatment, and the sooner the better. The treatment you get is a vaccine. Luckily, there's a dormancy period between becoming infected and the disease presenting symptoms. You've, you've got a window of opportunity there 
but you know, don't put it off. Go right away and get vaccinated at that point. You're in time, you know, that's, but if you don't get vaccinated, you will die. So even if you're not sure and you think an animal that's bitten you or that you've come in contact with in the wild might be rabid, you need to get yourself to a hospital and you need to get vaccinated. It used to be a horrible, horrible thing uh, being vaccinated for rabies. They gave the shots in the, in the stomach and it was horribly painful. And, you know, that's why people in areas where rabies is commonly found, like here, uh, know the signs of rabies and are so careful because, and so worried about it. Because, you know, if you don't get vaccinated, you die. If you do get vaccinated, it's horrible. And, you know, a lot of people still think that that's still the way they do the treatments. You know, five shots in the belly, horrible pain. Now, uh, we've moved on from that. Now you get four shots delivered in the deltoid area. That's this muscle here on top of your shoulders. And you get two shots when you first start treatment. And one is, I, have to, I wrote it down, I have to look at what it says because, okay, it's rabies immune globulin is one of the first two shots you get. And then on day seven, from the day that you get those first two shots, on day seven you get a third shot and on day 14, you get a fourth shot. So that's if you've been infected, okay? But people who work probably park rangers and things as well, you know, national parks and things, and uh, veterinarians, and now me, um, sometimes have to get pre exposed and you'll be fine if you are bitten or come in contact with an animal that has rabies and you get those shots and they're in your arm now, it's not as big a deal, you get those, you will be fine. Um, but people who stand a higher risk of becoming infected sometimes get what's called a pre-exposure vaccine. Now that's a series of three shots, correct? Let me look. Yes, that's three doses also given in your deltoid and you need to have regular booster shots and it won't prevent you from becoming infected with rabies. So even if you have the pre-exposure vaccine, which I don't recommend if you don't stand a big chance of becoming infected and your doctor wouldn't re recommend it either. But if you do stand a high risk of becoming infected or, or coming in contact with a rabid animal, yeah, might be a good idea. You know, you get the three shots if you haven't had it before with regular booster shots. And if you come in contact with a rabid animal, you still have to go for shots right after as soon as possible. Um, but you will only at that point need two shots instead of the four because you've already had some. Uh, but you still will need two more shots. Also given in the deltoid, you know. And... Um, so it's not as big a deal as it used to be uh, in terms of getting treated after exposure, but that's that's what the treatment is now. And if you get a pre-exposure vaccine, it's the three shots and regular boosters. And like I said, it's really unless you stand a really high chance of becoming uh, infected, you know, of coming in contact with a rabbit animal, then there's no reason for you to get those shots, like I said. And in fact, it's so few people who do get pre-exposure vaccines that uh, my doctor actually had to call the health department to find out how to go about it. And basically, uh, the way we left it is that I should call a veterinarian because they have to be vaccinated and find out how to go about it from the veterinarian who will then direct me where I can go and then if for insurance purposes my doctor needs to sign a release she'll do so. So that's my goofy story of me being an idiot and not realizing signs that I should have seen because look if you see an animal staggering around, a mammal, staggering around in an area where that where rabies exists as, as a thing and it's staggering around looking like it's drunk that animal is probably rabid but other signs of rabies can be just as simple as a mammal that's generally nocturnal being out running around during the daytime uh, or a diurnal animal just being out running around at night 
sure it's possible that this animal was sleeping and someone startled it or something chased it. But if an animal is out running around at a time that's not normal for the species, that is a definite warning sign, stay away from that animal. Another is any kind of behavior that's really odd for that species. And then as the disease progresses, other things will develop. The staggering I mentioned, because it, being it affects the central nervous system, it affects the balance, it affects the ability to control the major muscles, and they'll stagger uh, like an intoxicated person would. Uh, other signs, they often get really bloodshot eyes, really red bloodshot eyes, and their eyesight can be affected. So you'll see the animal trying to look at you, but it doesn't focus its eyes at all. Uh, and then, of course, is the, the more well-known, I think what most of us probably think of when we think of rabies, the foaming at the mouth. And I don't remember what that's caused by. I did know at one time. I don't remember. See, you can also develop, they, they develop uh, hydrophobia, fear of water. And I believe this is because the nervous system problems make it very difficult and painful to swallow. So it's really difficult for them to swallow. Sorry, I had an alarm in front of me and I don't know. This is a new thing and a new device and I don't know if you can see that alarm or not. If I was sure you couldn't, I wouldn't have even bothered touching it. But, you know, in case you can, I had to shut it off. But, um, yeah, the animal is, um, for me, is afraid of water and if I remember correctly, that it could be because they have difficulty swallowing so they can't swallow water. And then the foaming at the mouth, I don't recall for sure. It's one of these two things. It's either a direct result of the disease itself or it's because of the not taking in water, then bacteria causes the frothing. But that's, that's further on in it. You know, the first signs are the strange behaviors, not acting right for that species. It's as the disease progresses that you see the staggering, bloodshot eyes, frothing at the mouth. So, you know, your best bet if you're in the wilds in a place where there is such a thing as rabies is to, if you see an animal not acting the way it should, a mammal, go the other way. And, and basically, I mean, you shouldn't be, if you can avoid it, getting close enough to interact with wild animals anyway. They're not pets. They're wild. You know, they're not going to appreciate you trying to bother them. You know, you're either going to frighten them or you're going to make them angry. Either way, it's not a good thing. But in particular with rabies, you got to be careful. And so now we've gone over everything I could think of, and I've told you my embarrassing story. And, you know, if, if you have an embarrassing rabies-related story that you want to share, or a scary one, or one that, you know, thank goodness turned out well for you, or if you know anything else about the disease that you want to share, uh, you know, please feel free, leave a comment down in our comment section below. I'd love to hear it, and I'm sure everybody else would too. Now, the information I gave you as to a uh, pre-exposure vaccine or a post-exposure vaccine, which is just the normal rabies vaccine that you get if you come in contact with something, I got that information from the CDC website and my doctor. And so, you know, basically it's been verified. I've checked everything with the CDC website to be sure that I had it right and things. Um, and if you have any more questions, anything I haven't addressed, also feel free to ask that and I'll find out the answer for you as soon as I can and get back to you. And I hope that you guys had a, have a, a good time with me here during this video and that you go out and you enjoy yourself and that you live, love, learn and laugh as much as you possibly can. And we'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.